as my first slide indicates, I, I thought after I gave my title to Theo that I needed to announce ahead of time a little bit more what my topic is. I'm talking about simultaneous bilingual development. That is children who are exposed to two languages from if not birth from very soon after birth. And I'm gonna talk about why bilingual development in this circumstance is not easy, but it is possible. Um, so perhaps I should start by saying, why would anybody think it's easy? And I, I think there are a few uh, reasons. One, many, many papers begin with the observation that bilingualism is ubiquitous in the world. More children grow up exposed to multiple languages than grow up uh, exposed to a single language. Uh, the mind is not a monolingual mind by uh, nature. And so learning more than one language is a natural and a frequently occurring uh, event. Um, so just for that reason, why would it be difficult? It happens all the time. A second factor is it's done by children. So we all know that past a certain age, it becomes more difficult to to ever achieve native like uh, proficiency in a second language. But there is this idea that it's different for children. Uh, if ch children uh, can learn multiple languages and our experience as adults doesn't really apply to them. And finally, I think one of the reasons that people um, believe and argue that bilingual development is easy is that people used to say it's difficult. And we know that many of the things that have been said about bilingualism in the past are wrong. Um, dual language exposure does not create confused nonverbal children. People have said that. Dual language exposure does not cause cognitive impairment. That again is something uh, that people said. And so I think the pendulum ha has really swung very much in the opposite direction. Uh, to the view that bilingualism is a natural consequence of exposure to multiple languages. So what I'm going to talk about today is first evidence that bilingual development is not as easy as one might think. Um, then I'm going to move to evidence why bilingual development is not so easy. And then I'm going to conclude with some uh, speculations and suggestions for what makes bilingual development possible uh, nonetheless. So let me tell you a little bit about the context of the research I'm going to be focusing on. Most of the data that I'm going to present are data from my lab in South Florida. South Florida is a very bilingual place, particularly Spanish-English uh, bilingual. And so some people have the view that if you just walk outdoors, of course, you're going to learn uh, Spanish. But in fact, um, the reason South Florida is so bilingual has to do with continuing immigration. The majority of bilingual speakers in the, the county that includes um, uh, Miami, it, the majority of those uh, Spanish speakers are native Spanish speakers. They are foreign born. The children of these immigrants are bilingual to a degree. By the third generation, a great deal of data, both in Florida and elsewhere in the United States, a great deal of data show that by the third generation, Spanish and in fact, all heritage languages are largely lost. So that should be the first clue that maybe there are some obstacles to bilingual development, even in a circumstance where two languages are frequently spoken and heard, bilingualism does not sustain itself. So the, the children that I'm studying are these, children of whose parents are both or one is um, an immigrant from a Spanish speaking country. They hear Spanish at home, they are US born and live in the United States. I'm going to be talking about data from three different samples that we have studied. 
The first a sample followed children from the age of 22 to 30 months. It included 47 children who were being raised in bilingual homes and 56 English monolingual children. Another fairly unique uh, fact about bilingualism and the immigrant population in South Florida is that it is relatively affluent and educated. So the, the confound that exists in the world between socioeconomic status and heritage language use at home does not necessarily exist in South Florida. It certainly can be avoided if you advertise and get a volunteer sample. What we found, and we didn't set out to do this, um, but what we found is that the bilingual sample and the monolingual sample that we recruited through our ads did not differ in socioeconomic status as measured by parents' level of education. Both groups were fairly mid to high SES, and any differences in this sample between monolinguals and bilinguals are not a function of socioeconomic status. Um, in this sample and in other studies, what we do is we interview the primary caregiver and collect a great deal of data on language use in the home. And then we assess the children's English and Spanish language development using both um, uh, spontaneous speech measures and standardized assessments. And in this sample, we have data from 20, at 22, 25, and 30 months. Then in the second sample that we are still uh, following, we have a larger sample of Spanish English bilingual children. Here, the selection criterion was that one parent must be a native Spanish uh, speaker and an immigrant from a Spanish speaking country. And we have 35 um, or so English monolingual children. And the, the sample size is approximate because as you will see for different analyses, we have different selection uh, criteria. So the sample size moves around a bit. Um, in the second sample, the range of socioeconomic status was a bit wider. We tried to get a wider range in our bilingual sample with the result that on average, the bilingual families were less educated than the monolingual families. And so every analysis that I present controls for parental education. And again, we measured the language environment and the language development of these children. Um, these data were collected every six months from 30 months to five years. And then the third sample that I'm going to talk about a little bit is young adults. It's a different sample. It's what we think our sample will look like when they uh, grow up. We had 65 US born Spanish English bilinguals. We required of these bilinguals that they use both English and Spanish on a regular basis and that they were exposed to both languages before the age of five. Most of them were exposed to both languages from birth. And then for comparison purposes, we have 25 English monolinguals in the United States, and we have 25 native Spanish speakers who were recruited and tested in Santiago, Chile. Okay, so to the data, the evidence that makes me say bilingual development is not easy. Starting with our first and youngest sample, these data come from the uh, MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventories uh, in Spanish and in English. And here's the data from productive vocabulary. So if you look at this top uh, blue line, that's the vocabulary growth on the CDI in English for English monolinguals. And it looks pretty typical. The second line, the purple uh, solid line, is the English data for the bilingual children. And this line is significantly lower than the line for monolinguals. And in fact, the slope is also significantly different. So the bilingual children are, are behind the monolingual children in their English language development. And in fact, at this period, they're even growing at a slower rate. 
Now this dotted line down here is the same bilingual children assessed in Spanish. And there are two points to be, uh, to be noticed in uh, this line. The first is it's well below the English line. So when I say these bilinguals lag behind the monolingual children in English, it's not because I have a sample of Spanish dominant bilinguals. To the contrary, they are strongly on average English uh, dominant, and yet their English lags behind the English of monolinguals. And in th this sample of children who, I didn't tell you this, but on average, they hear about 50% English and 50% Spanish at home. Nonetheless, even at this very early age, when very few of them are in preschool, their English development is faster and stronger than their Spanish language development. And we see that for vocabulary, but it's not limited to vocabulary. This is the utterance length measure from the CDI. Again, English monolinguals, English in the bilinguals, and Spanish in the bilinguals. And there are more measures than this, but just to give you one more, when we ask the parents, that is, the CDI has this question, does your child put words uh, together? Um, at 22 months, what we see is 90% of the monolingual children are putting words together, which is about what you would expect for monolingual children. And the bilingual children um, are significantly below that. Now, another thing you can see in this graph is that on this measure, the bilingual children catch up. At 25 months, none of those differences is statistically significant any longer. So one question that people ask a lot when they see data like this that show the bilingual children lag, the question is, well, when do they catch up? And the answer to that question depends completely on the measure. If the measure is putting words together, they catch up in three months. But if the measure is vocabulary size, an awful lot of data suggests that they never catch up. So the, the question of catch up has to be framed more narrowly than just when do they start to not look different. Completely depends on the measure. And here are data from uh, the second study starting at 30 months going to 60 months. And again, you see the same pattern. This blue line is uh, now this is a, a fancier statistical procedure with uh, education controlled. But this is the estimated function for children who get 100% exposure to English, um, otherwise known as monolinguals. And these lines, the, the three different purple lines are the estimated growth in English for children with 75%, 50%, and 25% of their home language exposure in English. And that's a significant effect of exposure and a significant difference between the monolinguals and the bilinguals. And then over on the other graph, you see the, the same children, um, the same sort of analysis, only we don't have Spanish monolinguals. And you see that their Spanish development is below and has a shallower uh, growth uh, curve than the English language development. So the point so far is that bilinguals lag behind monolinguals in early language development. Where we have measures of grammar, the, the data show that the lag is not limited to vocabulary. This, this graph now is just a measure of uh, vocabulary, but we see the same pattern going up to five years of bilinguals lagging monolinguals in single language development, um, as some of you uh, may know from my papers, if you put those, those lines together, that is, if you add up where you can, where you have the CDI measures, if you add up their English and Spanish growth together, they are not different from monolingual children. Their total vocabulary size is almost identical um, at this very, very early age to that of monolingual children, but their total vocabulary knowledge is divided between two languages and each language is lower than it is for monolinguals who only know one language. All right, 
Um, so I'm going to finish describing these children by looking at what they uh, look like at the age of five years. This is the same um, sample that we followed from 30 months to five years. Here we plotted the children um, where they fall on a matrix of English vocabulary um, and Spanish vocabulary. And what you can see in this graph is at five years. So uh, the, the graph goes from zero to 90 because it's honest to start at zero and 90 is the highest score we have in any language, but it goes from zero to 90 in both languages. And if you divide the graph into quadrants, you see a very uneven distribution. There are, most of the children fall in this quadrant where their English scores are uh, above the median and, or above the midpoint, I should say, and their Spanish scores are below uh, the midpoint. And you have very few children in uh, the opposite uh, quadrant. But rather than dividing this uh, figure up um, in this a priori way, what we did is we did a cluster analysis of these scores to ask, um, to ask a data-driven question of, are there particular patterns of bilingual proficiency that we see among these children? And then the next question, of course, is what predicts uh, what pattern children display? So here are the patterns that the cluster analysis identifies or the profile. So I, I've indicated both with circles and colors, the four different clusters that the statistical procedure identifies. And you can see there, there's a profile one it is the lowest in both, profile four is the highest in both, and the other profiles are in between. And if, uh, if you look at this uh, bar graph on the right, I have graphed the English and Spanish mean vocabulary score for children in each profile. And I have put the profiles in the order of their total language score. So these kids are the highest in both and they are profile four. These children are the lowest in both, they are profile one. One thing uh, that you can see on oh, this, this line, um, sorry, it plots the prevalence of each profile. So this profile, profile three, is the most frequently occurring profile of kids who are pretty good in English and not so good in Spanish. The profile where the children are pretty good in both languages is the rarest of profile. Um, but if you, if you sort of squint and look at this uh, distribution, it's sort of like a normal curve with the very bottom cut off. And I think that's meaningful. That is, these children who are really strong in both languages are at the end of the normal distribution. And we don't have anybody down here who's really bad in both languages. And I think that's because one of the criteria for being in our study was we gave them the ages and stages screening at the age of two and a half. And any child who seemed at risk for language delay was not included in the study. So I think what this means is that if you included everybody, there is kind of a normal uh, distribution. But if there were children down here, that is with really low skills in both languages, they, I think, are children who are likely to have some organic language impairment. The, the point is very low skills in two languages is not an outcome of dual language exposure among typically developing children. Um, there are some other things uh, to glean uh, from this graph. You can look at these profiles and see that they differ both in total score and in balance. And there's no trade-off between them. And there's two ways you can, two, two kinds of things I can tell you to convince you there's no trade-off. One is if you go back to the scatter plot and just do a plain old correlation, the correlation is zero. This is not a p-value. This is an r-value. Um, 
So when you teach research methods and say, well, people never really find zero correlations, they do. Um, there is a zero correlation between children's English skill and children's Spanish skill, and I'm not the only one to have found this at all. Another way you can see there's no trade-off is look at the two bottom profiles. They are not different in English. One group is stronger in Spanish and the other group is weaker in Spanish, but there's no difference in English. And then you can see the exact same thing only move to a higher level of English in profiles three and four. Having said that, it is also the case that even these children who are strongest in English are statistically below the monolingual children on the same English measure. Now we move to sample three, the young adult college students. And we recruited them from college. So this is not a prospective study. The bilinguals who don't go to college are not in this sample. So it may be um, a very positive um, view of bilingual uh, English proficiency, but certainly it's not a rare occurrence. We had no problem um, getting lots of Spanish English bilinguals who fit uh, this picture. And when we test them in English, and now we, you know, we're talking about adults, so it's the measure is different. These are W scores, which is a kind of standard score. Um, from the Woodcock Munoz language uh, survey and um, showing you the data for three of the subscales. One is productive vocabulary. It's a picture naming task. Another is story recall. And the third is reading comprehension. And what you see across all measures, including ones I'm not presenting here, the English monolinguals and the Spanish English bilinguals are not different. Okay, none of these differences is statistically uh, significant, nor do they even look um, like they, they might be if you had more power. So these, these bilinguals have, on these measures, caught up to the monolinguals. But the Spanish story is different. Okay, so the purple bars are the same Spanish-English bilinguals. If you look across graphs, you can see that they're lower in Spanish than they are in English. And if you compare them to the red bars, who are the Spanish monolinguals, they are significantly lower on every measure. Now, these are college students um, in, uh, in, not in Spain, sorry, in Chile. Now, on these measures, vocabulary, story recall, and reading, the bilinguals these bilinguals have caught up to monolingual levels. But interestingly, it still shows that they're bilingual. This is a lexical retrieval task. It is, here's a picture, and they are pictures of very common objects. These are our data or are, are stimuli from Gisela Ja, for those of you who know her work. It's a duck, it's a house. It's, it's knowing the vocabulary item is not the problem. And the question is, how fast can you retrieve? Uh, that vocabulary item uh, measured in milliseconds. And here you see, even in English, where on more sort of ordinary day-to-day -day kinds of tasks, the bilinguals don't look different from the monolinguals, they do take longer to retrieve known words. This is a statistically significant difference but it pales in comparison to the size of the difference in Spanish. So this measure tells you, well, we can still tell that the bilinguals are bilinguals, even though they're functioning like monolinguals, but they are also uh, still far below, um, their Spanish skills are still far below their English skills. Okay. So to summarize, the evidence that I claim argues that bilingual development is not easy is that single language growth is slower in children learning two languages at the same time. On many measures, I showed you productive vocabulary. Uh, the children have not caught up to the monolinguals by age five, even in their dominant language. And if we ask what bilingual outcomes look like among young adults, 
we see that many young adults who are bilingual, given the definition, they use both languages on a regular basis, and they were exposed to both languages from before anybody's definition of the critical period cutoff. These bilinguals are at monolingual levels in most things in the dominant language and in, in the societal language, but their weaker language is substantially below that and significantly different from monolinguals. Okay, so just being exposed to two languages does not turn you into an adult-like native speaker of both languages. Um, okay, stop there, let's go on. Why? Why isn't bilingual development easier than these data suggest it is? Why do you need more than just exposure? Because it works for monolingual development. And I think the answer is here. Language acquisition requires environmental support. And the literature on that is enormous, but I can summarize it in four bullet points. The literature is studying the effects of the environment on the rate at which monolingual children acquire their language. Tells us that in order to acquire language, children need communicative experience. They need social engagement with someone who's talking to them. They need exposure to the target language and quantity of exposure matters. Exposure quality also matters. Not all exposure is equally supportive of language acquisition, and I could have a much longer list of references on different properties of exposure that matter for children's language development. And finally, there is evidence that the children need to be active participants in interaction and to use the language in order to maximally acquire the language. And I would argue that all of these things that we find as sources of support for monolingual development can be much harder to find for two languages in bilingual environments. And I will give you some evidence uh, for that. So let's start with communicative experience. I don't have data um, here. But except myself, I've been living in Florida for over 20 years and I don't speak Spanish. People think that just because it's all around, you're going to learn it. And that is simply not the case. And not only is it not the case for adults, it is not the case uh, for children. It is language that's only overheard, language that's only heard on television. And there are some studies to this effect. That is not sufficient uh, for language acquisition. You have to have interaction. Exposure quantity is different. On average, if language exposure is divided between two languages, then the amount of exposure children get to each language must be less than the amount of exposure they get to language in total. On average, bilingual children's exposure or the language exposure in bilingual environments to each language has to be less than monolingual exposure to a single language. Now, of course, you can take two children, one monolingual child that nobody talks to and a bilingual child that's talked to a lot. And those two children, that is the bilingual child very well could have more exposure to each language than the monolingual child. But unless parents of bilingual children consistently talk twice as much as parents of monolingual children, there will be average uh, differences. And there is strong evidence of effects of quantity in bilingual development. This is one of the most robust findings in the literature. And I will just remind you of uh, one uh, slide. Um, the, this is the effect of the quantity of exposure to English. This is the effect of the quantity of exposure to Spanish. And that is what makes the monolinguals line above all these other lines. 
Now you may notice if you look at the English uh, a graph carefully that it's not quite a linear effect. This is actually a significant quadratic effect. Um, and I think that's because the more English uh, in these households, um, the more the English comes from native speakers of English. So we have quantity and quality of exposure confounded to agree. The children, the children who hear more English also hear higher quality English. And I'll give you more data to that effect shortly. So, so far we've said it's not enough that the environment be bilingual, you have to have direct experience. The amount of experience you get matters and it's harder to, it, it's difficult to get the same amount of experience in two languages as monolingual children get in one. And now we're gonna move to something that takes a little bit longer to argue. Exposure quality is different for bilinguals. Frequently, it certainly is in the minority majority heritage language circumstance that I'm talking about. We, um, we collected diary uh, data on, um, so for one week um, in, in both study one and study two, for one week, the mothers kept diaries for every half hour, what language is my child hearing and who is speaking um, that language to the child. And based on those records, we found that more than half of the bilingual children's exposure to English comes from speakers who are not themselves native speakers of English. And furthermore, in the same studies, and this has been rep this is replicated in, in both uh, samples, non-native exposure is less supportive of language development than native exposure. That is, in regressions, the amount of English children here, the relative amount of English children here is a significant predictor of their English skill. And over and above that, the proportion of their English exposure that comes from native English speakers is an additional positive predictor of their English language development. And so the next two, sets of data that I'm going to present to you ask why. Why, um, why would exposure from native speakers be better for language development than exposure from non-native speakers? And I'm going to argue that it all has to do with the proficiency of native speakers. And of course, there's variability in proficiency within non-native speakers, and so that matters. Highly proficient native speakers look, sorry, highly proficient non native speakers have characteristics of their child directed speech that look more like that of native speakers. But many non native speakers who have fairly limited proficiency nonetheless use English in speaking to their children, and the quality of their child directed speech is different. And that's not an obvious result. That is, why would an adult's level of proficiency matter when they're talking to a two-year-old? Because we all restrict our vocabulary talking to, to two-year-olds. But here's the evidence. And there's two sources of evidence. One is direct evidence from measures of child-directed speech. So I told you we collected spontaneous speech samples. We have mother-child conversation um, at 30 months and we analyze properties of the mother's speech. And that's the, the first um, source of data that I will present to you. So um, in this sample, we have native uh, English speaking mothers. We have non-native English speaking mothers who rate their own proficiency as good. And we have non-native English speaking mothers who rate their own proficiency as limited. And for the non-native speakers, we used only the mothers whose age of arrival in the United States was after 12. So if they were born in Chile, but they came to the United States when they were three, we don't really count them as non-native uh, speakers of English. 
Um, so these are all mothers talking to their uh, two and a half year old children on in the usual, here's a bag of toys uh, kind of procedure. And what uh, I'm giving you two of, of multiple measures that we looked at. We measured uh, the mean length of the mother's utterances to her child and the number of word types used in, this is in a 20 minute speech uh, sample. And what we found is for this and for every other measure that has been found in the literature to be a positive predictor of language development, the native speakers are the highest, the non-native speakers with good proficiency are next, and the non-native speakers with limited proficiency are the lowest in MLU and in lexical diversity, that is the number of different words they use. And this measure of lexical diversity translates into also less diversity in main verbs, less diversity in the number of nouns used as sentence subjects. And these are other measures that have been found to predict not only vocabulary, but grammar as well. So the point here is there are proficiency differences between native and non-native speakers and proficiency differences among non-native speakers that show themselves in properties of child-directed speech that have demonstrated effects in other studies on children's language development. So that's one source of evidence for why the proportion of English that children hear from native speakers is a unique predictor of their English language development over and above how much English they hear. Okay, here's um, the next source of evidence, and this is indirect evidence. Um, I told you that the Spanish speaking population in South Florida is fairly affluent and educated. And so you can find many mothers who are college educated and they got their college degree in a Spanish speaking country before immigration. So we can look for effects of maternal education as a function of whether that education was completed in English or in Spanish. Now we know there's a huge literature that maternal education predicts all sorts of things about child development, including language development. And there are lots of reasons why uh, that might be in terms of what college educated mothers know about children and what they need. But I'm focusing on a particular hypothesis and that is that when you are college educated, you use language in a different way than when you are not college educated. And that effect on language use is going to be specific to the language in which you achieved your education. So my education in English doesn't help me if, I'm, if I try to speak to my child in Spanish and vice versa. So that's the hypothesis that we tested. We um, coded our mothers in terms of, did they have a college degree earned in English? Did they have a college degree earned in Spanish? These are all um, Spanish, um, that is native Spanish speakers born in a Spanish speaking country. For the purposes of this analysis, we restricted ourselves to those children who had two native Spanish speaking parents because it turns out, a little factoid for you, the probability that um, a mother, that a woman marries a native English, that an immigrant woman marries a native English speaker is related to her own level of education. So you get a confound with maternal education in terms of the father's language if you don't restrict it um, in this way. Okay, so here we have children who have two Spanish speaking parents, but looking at their mothers, some of these mothers did not go beyond high school um, in Spanish. And some of the mothers have a college degree in Spanish and same thing for English. And now what we're looking for is effects of or differences between these two groups in vocabulary growth in English and in Spanish. Again, looking between 30 months and five years. 
And all of the growth curves that I'm going to show you are adjusted for differences in the quantity of English and Spanish children here at home. So here's the first graph. These are, this is the growth curve in English for these 90 uh, some children as a function of maternal level of education in English. And what you can see is the children whose mothers have a four-year degree or more are significantly above the children whose mothers have less than a four-year degree earned in English. And remember, these are all immigrant mothers whose native language is Spanish, but some of them, after they immigrated, got a degree in English, and some of them did not, and it made a difference to their children's English language development. Interestingly, however, it made no difference to their children's Spanish language development. So the fact that these mothers are now coded as higher SES because they have a higher level of education did not benefit their children's Spanish at all. So I would argue that this is evidence that the kind of English proficiency you get by going to college in English translates into a benefit to the children's English language development. And it is a benefit that is specific to English. So it's not just you know, knowing that a rich environment is a good thing to have. I would argue, although we don't have direct evidence, that it has to do with properties of their child-directed speech. And we can do sort of a little control comparison. Mother's level of education in Spanish is related to their children's Spanish language development. The differences are less dramatic because there's less Spanish acquisition to account for, but there is a significant difference in the Spanish growth and in the, the mean level of Spanish between the children of mothers who have a college degree that they earned in Spanish and the children whose mothers um, did not earn a college degree in Spanish, even if they did earn one in English. And similarly, as was the case for the effect of English education on Spanish, there is no effect of Spanish education on children's English vocabulary. So these high SES immigrants do a better job than the lower SES immigrants of supporting their children's Spanish language development, but it does not translate into better uh, English language development. Again, the effects of education are language specific. Okay, last topic, and I'm gonna have to do this quickly, is the child's participation. So, Bilingual children have options that monolingual children don't. That is, if I'm a bilingual child and my bilingual mother is talking to me in Spanish, I don't have to answer her in Spanish. I can answer her in English. Um, and children frequently do this. Children frequently choose to use the majority language over the minority language. And this has consequences for expressive language growth. And I'll apologize for going through this quickly, but what you're going to see is data to support this assertion. So the first data are concurrent data. Here we have a sample of children at 30 months. Um, they get about 50-50 English and Spanish at home, but their use of English and Spanish is not as balanced. That is, we, we ask the mothers questions about their children's language use, and what the mothers told us um, is sometimes when I, when I speak to my child in Spanish, he sometimes answers me in English. Some children do this, some children don't, and similar the other way around. And what you see is far more children switch to English when addressed in Spanish than the other way around, which means that although their English and Spanish exposure is relatively balanced, their language use is much more English dominant. And what you see in these same children at this same time point is that their comprehension abilities in English and Spanish are quite comparable, but their expressive vocabularies are not. They are significantly stronger in English. Now, these are concurrent data. 
So maybe it means that language use affects vocabulary, but maybe it means that vocabulary affects language use. <coughs> Excuse me. What you need is prospective longitudinal data. And so that's the next thing uh, that we did. We took, <coughs> sorry, we took um, mother's answers to this question about their children's language use. And we identified some children who only switch to English when addressed in Spanish, but never the other way around. So these are kids whose English output is greater. <clears throat> and then we also, again, from the mothers, identified children who, who, based on their mother's report, never switch when they are spoken to in Spanish, but sometimes when they're English, when they're spoken to in English, they answer in Spanish. That's less frequent, but at this young age, it does happen. And so we have two groups of children, those whose English output is greater than their input and those whose English output is less than their input. And these are the growth curves between 30 and 42 months for those groups of children. And I've plotted it for, um, I think it's uh, one standard deviation above the mean for input. So, the, the difference between the solid line and the dotted line are input effects. And you see input effects in the kids who speak English more, and you see input effects in the children who speak English less. But overall, you see significant effects of output alone controlling for input. Not only are these children uh, the children who use English more than they hear it, not only are they stronger in English, but they are growing at a faster rate, which suggests that the causal uh, influence works from use to acquisition, not from skill to use. Okay, and uh, prospectively, um, language use does not predict comprehension in my data. I wouldn't argue it has no effect on comprehension, but it has a stronger effect on expressive language skill. Okay, so in sum, environmental factors make uh, bilingual development more difficult uh, than monolingual development, and these are the factors. Quantity of exposure is less, quality of exposure may be lower, it often is uh, for our children at least. And what affects quality of exposure is different for the societal language and the heritage language. For the societal language, the quality of exposure is diminished by low proficiency uh, sources of exposure. For the heritage language, uh, it's different, and I don't have direct evidence for this, but uh, often parents have lower levels of education in that language. So the idea that all immigrants are perfectly wonderfully uh, proficient speakers of their native language is not necessarily always the case. Just the way there are um, SES effects on the quality of child-directed speech among monolingual English speakers, we have, there's no reason why there wouldn't be SES effects on the quality of the Spanish that native Spanish-speaking parents address it to their children. But another big, big factor is the heritage language is only used at home. And in the United States, with a very few exceptions, it is not used in school. And so the, the functions to which language, uh, the heritage language is put are far more limited than the functions to which the societal language is put. And then lastly, the, the prestige of the languages is not equal. And this may be a factor in why children choose to speak English uh, more uh, than Spanish. But the data make it clear that the better kids get in English, the worse they get in Spanish, although the converse is not true. So it's not as though these two languages are competing for space in the brain, because then it would be a symmetrical composition, uh, competition. Um, Knowing English interferes with acquiring Spanish, but knowing Spanish does not interfere with acquiring English. And I won't go into 
all of the longitudinal data uh, that supports that, but um, it's clear in my data and it's clear in Ginny Catterkill's data from Wales as well. And finally, as I said, the children choose to use the societal language. So now I'm going to assume I've convinced you that bilingual development isn't easy, and I'm going to assume I've convinced you that there are multiple reasons why that's the case. And I'm going to spend five minutes acknowledging that bilingual development is possible and try to think about some of the reasons why that might be. So here's one reason. You can overall have a more enriched uh, language environment and that will support bilingual development. So the children who, um, who successfully acquire uh, two languages, and I know Theo's gonna uh, get me for this, but I'll come back to that. Um, maybe those children who have more language exposure overall, higher quality exposure to each language, and circumstances that give both languages functional value. So minority majority language bilingualism is by this analysis more difficult in the sense of less likely to happen um, than bilingual development in a larger environment where both languages have uh, the same functional value, equal prestige and so on. Uh, but those are environmental uh, factors. I think there's also um, some other interesting factors that have to do with the mechanism uh, of language acquisition itself. Uh, so one of them is the effects of exposure are nonlinear. And the, the data for this really come from work by Ellen uh, Thorderdotter. Um, but basically, uh, what it means is twice as much language input is not going to result in twice as fast language acquisition. That's clear in the data. And so what that means is if you take, if, if you reduce exposure to one language by say 30%, so instead of getting 100% English, you take away 30% and you get only 70% English and you move that 30% of your exposure to Spanish that 30% that you've moved from English to Spanish is going to help Spanish more than it's going to hurt English. And so that's one reason that even though it does take longer to acquire two languages at the same time, it doesn't take twice as long. There are, there are savings. Now, why would the effects of exposure be nonlinear? Well, think about why quantity of exposure matters. One reason it matters is you hear each item more frequently. And Jen Ellen Huttenlocker has a 1991 paper that demonstrates this uh, very nicely. Um, hearing a word 10 times results in better learning than, or it results in a higher probability of using that word than hearing a word once. But frequency affects across domains tend to have ceilings. So even though hearing a word 10 times is better for acquisition than hearing it once, hearing it 100 times is probably not 100 times uh, better. Exposure also matters because it's related to item diversity. That is the more a mother talks to her child, the wider a range of vocabulary she is likely to use. But there's clear evidence from all the work on type token ratios that the longer you talk, yes, the more words you use, but with increasing, with diminishing uh, returns. And so that's another reason why the effects of quantity of exposure on language acquisition would be nonlinear. And finally, and we don't know too much about this, but clearly there are maturational constraints. No matter how much you talk to a six month old, she's not gonna answer you in sentences. Um, and so there's maturational constraints, both limit how fast it's possible to acquire a language and also may, there, there may be cognitive um, developments that underlie language acquisition that work to the, that underlie development in two languages. Almost done. Um, so transfer, uh, some things don't need to be learned twice. We can see this um, in languages with lots of cognates where the, some of the words are almost the same. 
And we can also see it in uh, Joanne Paradis uh, data. She has really nice evidence that if uh, this is from children learning a second, children learning English as a function of what their first language is. And all of these first languages are very different, but if your first language marks the tense on verbs, you're faster at learning to mark tense on verbs in English than if your first language doesn't do that at all. So some things do not need to be learned twice. And that is part of what makes learning two languages not twice as hard as learning one. And finally, and this is my last slide, and this is where Theo comes in, because I gave a talk a few years ago, and Theo was in the audience, and I said something about success, who's a successful bilingual. And he called me out on that, and he said, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't call these kids who are English dominant and uh, less uh, advanced in Spanish. They're not necessarily unsuccessful bilinguals. They just are different bilinguals. They use Spanish for the purposes to which Spanish can be put in their environment. And I, I acknowledge that, that criticism. I've embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, I think one of the things that makes bilingualism so uh, ubiquitous in the world is that bilingualism takes many different forms. And it is not the form that was once upon a time the definition of bilingual, that is a native like speaker of two languages. That is vanishingly rare. The world is populated with lots and lots of bilinguals who use two languages, use them to good effects, but they are not two monolinguals in one person. The end state of bilingual development is not equal and perfect competence in two languages. And on that note, I will say thank you. Thanks to my many, many uh, collaborators and sources of support for uh, these research projects. And some of them, not all of them are listed here.